Okay, so, so as I mentioned, uh, history of karate is there's a lot of word of mouth, the documentation's pieced together, and so uh, so some of this it's it's not as factual and, and frankly as easy to read as other types of history, but it's there and it is very interesting. Uh, and so the styles were set by the 1930s. So the styles of karate. So again, keep in mind this is a history of karate, not the martial arts. There's some reference to other martial arts, but for the most part, it's karate. And so the styles themselves weren't really set until they're, they're, they until the 1930s, so less than 100 years ago. And really, they continued to develop and evolve up until the 1980s. Uh, I've, I've got to keep my comments a little shorter than I intended, but let me let me go ahead and uh, finish the thought. So the 1930s, it was the 1930s. Now you have set styles. So remember, this is the 1930s. Then, as you'll you'll hear, it wasn't until 1946 that karate really was introduced to the United States. So then, so 1946, then. You know, it had to grow a little bit. That took around 10 years or so for anything to happen at all. And then you hit the 60s, and now it's starting to mature, but it's still only 15 years old in America. And so the 60s, now people are getting hyped up, and they're seeing karate, and they're getting into it. And now you've got um, certain instructors. Now they're branching out. They're starting their own styles. And so there was this, like, second wave of the evolution of the styles of karate that continued on into the 70s, and that's what's meant by the history is largely set after 1980. At, at, in the 80s, then, everything kind of started to settle down, and everything was as it generally is today. So we want you to appreciate the history of what you're part of. There's a couple incredible pictures that Sensei JC pulled out that are taken in the 1930s. And we could easily put any of you right in that picture and you would be doing the exact same thing. So it's just it's just this this whole karate thing um, and the history of it being part of it and knowing that it's all been passed down by word of mouth across the globe. And you're going to continue on that tra tradition and legacy for decades to come. And then when you get our age, then somebody else is going to be doing it. So really appreciate the history that you're part of. You're, you're, you are part of something special. And then, like I just said, appreciate your responsibility to understand this history and to pass on the traditions and history of karate to others. Sensei JC. So to begin with, we're going to go through like a geopolitical background of how and where uh, karate originated. So, or Karate originated on the island of Okinawa. Where is that? Okinawa is one of many islands that are called the Ryukyu Islands that are to the south of Japan and to the east of China and also not far away from South Korea. Uh, the island itself um, is fairly long and narrow. Uh, the north of the island is mostly forests and the most populated part of the island is to the south of the island. And that's where also the three cities that you'll hear of is Naha, Shuri, and Tumari are there towards the south of the island. And because of its geopolitical location right to the south of Japan and to the east of China, the islands were exposed to a lot of cultural and economic influences from both China and Japan. So over the centuries, there was a lot of trade and cultural exchange happening between China, Okinawa, Japan, and Korea. So real quick, these are actual pictures that I did, photographs before the before the advent of digital cameras and cell phones of when I was in Okinawa. So the one on the right here, that's from the air as I was leaving. But you can see, you know, you get a good, obviously you can do this on Google, Google Earth, but that's not as cool as this. Uh, this was actually from the airplane as I was leaving, but you can see that it's relatively narrow and uh, long enough where it wasn't even able to capture part of it. And then you can see the, the difference in the geography. This is down near Naha, busy, base hustle bustle city, as big as it can be on a 70 mile island. And then this is toward the north. This is called Maida Point. Uh, but you can see just it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful island geographically and from a from a natural history standpoint. Um, 
the ocean is incredible as well. This is there's uh, there's Sheehan back in his heyday scuba diving, and then uh, these are, I took these actually with a with an underwater camera, but you can see how clear the water is, and then uh, and then you can kind of see here's a real how forested it is in certain areas, very much like a jungle. Uh, this is I took this picture. It's just a silly building that was near our house with this airplane on top. Um, just to kind of show the the culture, so it's it is a it is a pretty amazing little island with a lot of different things to see and do. In addition to its incredible uh, history related to karate. So, from a political historical political perspective, um, when we go back to the 14th century, the island was composed of three states, and it was a feudal system. So you had a feudal lord, basically running the northern part of the island, another one managing the center part of the island, and then a third feudal lord um, reigning the southern part of the island. And at the time they would call it part of a three kingdoms. And in 1429, um, there was a lord by the name of Shohashi. He united um, the three states, if you wish, the three uh, kingdoms into one kingdom and it was called the Ryukyu Kingdom. And uh, he put his capital in Shuri, and that's where Shuri Castle is. So if you see uh, under 1609, um, that's a picture of Shuri Castle. And, um, and um, unfortunately, it's a World Heritage Site. And a few months ago, unfortunately, it, uh, it succumbed to fire, similar to Notre Dame, and so parts of it burned down. And, um, one of his, so after Shohashi, there were a bunch of other kings and in, uh, in the year 1477 to 1526, uh, there was a king called Shoshin who reigned then and he put a stop to the entire feudal system. So he removed all feudal lords and he banned all weapons and no one was allowed to own any weapons in large quantities and no one was allowed to walk around with a bladed uh, sword or anything like that. And that weapons ban went on for centuries. And in fact, in 1609, um, uh, the Tsetsuma clan out of Japan invaded Okinawa and they took over the, the kingdom. Uh, they retained the king, the king himself and Okinawa as a kingdom had a semi-independent trading state, but they were basically run by uh, the Japanese Tsetsuma clan. And the Tsetsuma clan continued the weapons ban throughout then. And they, in addition to the weapons ban, they banned any imports of bladed weapons as well. And then finally in 1829, um, uh, the Japanese annexed the entire kingdom and it became a prefecture of, uh, of, called the prefecture of Okinawa and it became part of Japan. They abolished the monarchy and the, the last king that was living at the time, um, he was removed and uh, he was moved to Tokyo and um, he became a marquee in Tokyo. And the final big milestone in the island of Okinawa happened in 1945 during the invasion, the US invasion in World War II. In fact, it was one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Uh, about 240,000 people died on Okinawa and about 14,000 US soldiers died. And, um, and that's sort of gives you a little bit of a historic background, political background as to uh, yeah. what happened to Okinawa. So we can go to the next Any slide. Any questions up to this point? All right, <clears throat> feel free to ask as, as they come up. So what was important in this history was the fact that there was this weapons ban, which was actually unique in the world. Um, and uh, if we can go to the next slide, Shihan. Um, and so um, because weapons were outlawed, um, the feudal lords had to resort to uh, other ways of self-defense. And uh, so um, self-defense um, methodology uh, was created and it was called T. Uh, te in Japanese, and it was held in secret, and um, it was basically uh, self-defense with no weapons. It was basically 
uh, te meaning hand, and um, it was historically done by the kings, the local lords, and all these lords that lived in Shuri. It was held in secrecy, so not much is known about it. Um, of course, there, nothing was written down, everything was handed down orally, and, and not much, and it was basically since it was held in secrecy, not much was known about it at the time. But it was done over the centuries throughout the, the era of when weapons were banned. So we go to the next slide. So this T over the years developed into Tode. <coughs> tode means Chinese technique. So as we've seen earlier, uh, there was a lot of Chinese influence and Japanese influence into Okinawa. And um, so over the years, a lot of Chinese came to Okinawa and or Okinawans went to China. And due to this Chinese influence, um, they also brought over uh, what was called Chinese boxing from China. It is unclear whether um, uh, Tode was basically introduced by Chinese in Okinawa or whether it was um, it happened by Okinawans going to China and bringing it back to Okinawa. So that's unclear. I'm sure it's a bit of both because of, you know, over centuries, all this influence back and forth, there's a little bit of both happening at the same time. Um, the first actual recorded event of Tode that was written down was in the latter part of the 18th century, early 19th century, when a Chinese by the name of Kusanko displayed his Chinese boxing skills in Okinawa. So that's the first thing we ever hear about Tode. So I, we put in this picture here on the right. So that's my Kempo Popodo karate class all in, in Okinawa. And that's like circa, I think it's this picture is probably 1993, 1994. So, um, so what's that? Um, almost 20 to 25 years ago or so. And um almost 30 years well time flies um and my point there was that this is 25 30 years ago looks familiar right ever done that <laughs> you know did the did the leg stretch on the floor and 30 years before that they would have seen the same thing and 30 years before that you would have seen the same thing so um so as much as you see so, so the point here is again that there's all this early the early development that happened with karate up through this tode, um, and then it's then it just it just started slowly coming together to which to to provide some that not provide that natural with some naturally occurring consistency, and and here we are today um, doing the same thing that I was doing and Sensei Tom was doing 30 years ago, and that they were doing before before that so. Again, like we said, to appreciate so all this early, these early years back in the you know early late late 18th century, 19th century, uh, slowly started to come together. And so at Tode, so you had Te, which was very beginning. So Tode now is starting to get a little bit more popular. There's there's now people that are being associated with something. He to, uh, Kusanku is doing some public demonstrations, all but. Keep in mind, all of this is still in this little tiny island here called Okinawa, um, and that's really about it. You know, just the other the other point is that again, this is just karate, but the really the only other martial arts that was being practiced was in China. So karate is one of the it's not the first. Generally, uh, Shaolin Kung Fu is known as like the first official. Uh, um, standard uh or oriental martial art but you can see now uh, you know how this this thing really did go from something kind of small that was a necessity to something that evolved to a way of life for a much broader population and then so this tode continued to develop over the years and um in the various cities in um in in okinawa and eventually turned into so and it, and so in those different cities it began having its own character depending on the city that they were in, and and so Tode turned into Nahate in the city of Naha, Tomari Te in the city of Tomari, and Shuri Te in, in the city of Shuri, 
um, you know, these three cities, they're not very far from each other. They're actually only a few miles from each other. And at the time, they were probably just villages. Naha was more the commercial and industrial center of the island. Tomari was where the fishermen and more the, um, the farmers lived. And Shuri was where the castle and the feudal lords lived. Okay. Next. So here, this is a slide showing how uh, basically the development of karate from its early, early uh, nascent stages. Um, in the 14th century, you had, this is a picture of uh, uh, one of the Ryukyun kings uh, uh, with his basically soldiers protecting him. Um, and um, they were the ones that were uh, uh, performing uh, the T or the Te, the traditional Okinawan martial art. Um, that was very linear in form, that had uh, roots in, in samurai sword fighting. So it was very linear and, uh, you know, straight punches and things like that, that turned into tode over the years. Um, and tode was basically influenced from Fujin, from the Chinese Kung Fu, Fujin White Crane um, over the centuries. Um, and, um, and then um, in the 19th century, the basically Tode turned into Tomarite, Shurite, and Nahate. Um, and important to note here is that uh, we'll learn later how Nahate, in Nahate, um, there was basically a direct influence from China where um, um, they went to China and brought uh, uh, some of the uh, Chinese um, katas over. And, and so you'll see a slight difference in terms of the style whereas Shurite and Tomarite are more uh, influenced by the T and the Te, which is the direct uh, linear styles. Nahate has more of the circular movements uh, that we see in, um, uh, in, uh, in the circular and the more softer movements that we see in the Kung Fu styles. Um, Shurite eventually turned into Shotokan and Nahate um, uh, turned into Gojuru, which we'll see later. Now, one interesting thing is here, uh, and there's a picture of uh, uh, a drawing out of the Bubishi. The Bubishi was also over the years, um, uh, masters had written down their techniques, um, and that's coming from China. They would write down their techniques and they would write down articles and everything. And, and this Bubishi was handed down from master to master, and from master to master, and, um, and was held, of course, in absolute secrecy. And in one of the pictures that I found is the one up there. And you, if, if you look correctly, you might recognize uh, one of our katas in that. Um, does anyone want to try to see which kata that anyone? is? Anyone? That's Sayuchin? That's Sayuchin. Yeah. And that's, that's from the Bubishi out of, uh, uh, coming out of China. It's interesting to see how these styles actually evolved and where, where ideas came from. So, um, so that's uh, any questions on the history and the political history of the, of the martial arts? So let me add two things. So one of these, and we actually, this is just an editorial um, oversight. This arrow before, when you get this presentation, this arrow will, will have two heads on it. One going this way and one coming this way. Oh yes. Sorry. So this, this tends to imply that Fujian White Crane went and that's where Nahate came from. It's not, it's not the case. So what was again, was happening is you have the, the, the T and Tore were organically developed within Okinawa. Then you had some certain individuals, most of those from Nahate at the time, they were going back to China and bringing techniques and concepts back with them. So that's as to, to reinforce the point Sensei JC was making, that's why Goju-ru, and, and that was essentially where Goju-ru came from. And that's why Goju-ru has that soft side of it, uh, because they, the, the practitioners of Nahate were the primary uh, practitioners who spent any time in China. So this will be a double-headed arrow. So know that, so Nahate came from this direction, from within Okinawa, but then 
some of the practitioners went to China and integrated into that into it, and that's where Yamawashi came from, and and Kake, and some of these other these, some of the other softer kung fuish type moves, um, some of the taller stances, that kind of thing. So so really so where we're at now is this is right now we're at the history. That's kind of the end of the history of karate. So we're at a point now where you've got styles. And so I think the next section is Goju, right? Yeah. So, um, so that's really it. So, you know, again, when you get this presentation and you need to to recap it and reinforce what you, what we're talking about, because we're going pretty quickly also, uh, that's, that's really it. Again, this early, these early stages in the 1400s, weapons taken away, all that's real. Um, then there was some protective measures put in place, T, and then Tore, and then they started practicing it regionally, and now you've got the styles. That that makes sense? And so we're going to just talk about Goju-ru, but obviously each one of these um, has its own. But really, at this point, let me just make one more comment. So really, there... Um, Tamari te, it's 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 very difficult to you notice there's nothing there. Tamari te um, was uh, there's really no legitimate reliable source to indicate what branched off from Tamari te. So and and also it's not we're simplifying it a little bit in that there were other styles that branched off from Shuri te and Naha te, but yes. there weren't very many. So a uh, Shuri. Um, uh, Shorinru was another one, and um, there's a couple others that escape me right now. But really, so the true traditional styles branched out from here. Then, as I mentioned, in the 60s and the 70s, that's when you started getting uh, American Kempo and Wado Ru and some of these other styles that were really just individuals branching out and creating their own styles. So. Goju and Shotokan, the point here is Goju and Shotokan for sure are two of the purest styles if, uh, that tie back to the early days of the regional pant, the regional te that was there. So um, again, if you're, if you have any interest or feel any, you know, you want to be tied to a true traditional style rather than something that an individual came up with, um, you're in it because Gojuru absolutely is one of those. And of course, again, Shotokan is as well. All right. So let's talk about Gojuru. So our story in Gojuru starts with a young boy named Kanryu Higawana. Kanryu Higawana's father owned uh, three little boats that he, um, he had a trading company and um, he was a businessman. And, and so Kanrio would work with his dad on these boats from a very, very young age uh, in Naha. Uh, and uh, the family came from a lower class samurai, a lower samurai class family. And um, there was another a bigger ship called the Shinkosen um, that basically traveled between China, uh, Okinawa, South Korea, and I mean, Korea and Japan, and would, um, you know, if people could travel on it and it, it uh, carried um, goods and, and, and things like that. And uh, the father worked on that as well. And uh, when, when Kanrya was about 13 years old, his father um, uh, was in a fight and, and was killed. And it affected Kanrya so much that he vowed to avenge his death. So. Um, next slide. Which we don't have the luxury of doing anymore, but it probably was the real deal back then. I'm going to get that guy. Yes, yeah, I'm going to get that guy. And so he set out, I'm going to learn the martial arts and uh, to avenge my dad's death. And um, he decided at the age of 15 to set sail to Fozu, China. And if you look at that map, it's actually all the way... Um, to the uh, the west, so it's uh, it's uh, in China, and uh, he he went there at the age of fifteen. In fact, he went on that same ship that his father used to work on, that uh, the one the Shinbuzen, and um, he found this master called Ryu Ryu Kuroshi, 
who practiced uh, Fujian White Crane. And um, he learned that uh, at the Shaolin Temple in the mountains of Fujian. This, uh, the, that, that's a picture of the Shaolin Temple right there. And it still exists now, and there are monks there still practicing uh, that type of martial art. And you can go and visit it actually today, even. And, and so uh, Kanryo ended up spending 14 years with Ryu Ryu Ko, not only learning the martial art, but also herbal medicine as well, and, and weapons. And it seems that there was some connection always, and even if in the Bubishi, there are sections of the Bubishi I was reading that, that talk about herbal medicine. So it seems that there was a connection between the martial art and, 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 and medicine at the time. Okay. And then, so uh, after 14 years, Higawada returned to Naha in Okinawa, that was in 1881. And he brought with him nine katas. Uh, the katas were Sanshin, Saifa, Seunshin, Shisoshin, Sansaru, Sepai, Kurunfa, Sesan, and Superinpai. Practically the majority of our Gojuru katas uh, he brought with him from Fujian, uh, China. And he began teaching the martial arts. He started a school in around 1885, a few, later, a few years later. And, um, and this, because it was in Naha, uh, that martial art, the one we spoke about, was called Nahate. And um, around 1900, um, Higawana accepted uh, one of his uh, students, which we'll get to know a little bit better in a second. His name was Shoju Miyagi. And that was around 1900, and Chojun Miyagi's age was 14 years old at the time. And there's a picture here. There's actually, this is, I think, the only picture you have, we have of Kanryu Higawana. He's sitting there, and in the background, you see Chojun Miyagi. Okay. So before we leave, you're going to, before we move to the next slide, you're going to see this. So before we get there, what are the three kata then that were yet to be developed? Maybe it's more than three. I don't know. I forget oh, I how many. Don't you cut it? Joe Don. Joe Don. Pegasi. Yes. One. Joe Don. Joe Don. Someone mentioned Bushak. Second Nazi Jitsu. No. Nope. I think 12, 12, 12 traditional goju. The Show? Did somebody mention that already? The Sai uh, Show was Shotokan. Uh, yeah, Shotokan. That's later. That's not one of the good one, but it's not one of the twelve. Ten Show. So, yes. Ten Show. Yeah. And then Gigasai I need. So two Gigasai and then and Ten Show. Good job. So Shoujun Miyagi. Um, um, was born into a wealthy merchant family, uh, and his his aunt was the uh, basically leader of that family, and her son passed away. So uh, Chojun Miyagi was next in line to to basically uh, the the oldest son, and he was going to be the next leader of the family. So she wanted to to become strong and learn the martial arts. So uh, he started martial arts when he was very young, and. Um, he was so good at it that his, his teacher said, you have to go and meet uh, one of our best teachers. His name is Kanryu Higawana in Naha. Uh, and you'll learn much more from him than, uh, than from me. So uh, when he was 14 years old, um, his teacher sent him over to Kanryu Higawana's school. And, and then um, uh, that's when he started uh, uh, learning under Kanryu Higawana. And uh, the training was very, very tough. So at the time, they actually, um, uh, he, uh, being so young, he had to do a lot of chores first and uh, he had to do a lot of stuff work. And, and on more than one occasion, Yagi just considered giving up. He just didn't want to stay there. And in fact, that's similar to the story of uh, the Karate Kid. It's practically almost the same story where um, the Karate Kid gets, uh, you know, starts working with the, uh, with, the, with his master there, and uh, his master starts telling him, you know, he has to do all these chores at his house and you know, painting the fence and and um, uh, waxing the car. So uh, that's where they got the story for Karate Kid from, actually. 
And, um, but Higuana noticed that uh, Chojo Miyagi was a very special uh, uh, student because he was one of his best students. And uh, interestingly enough, when they taught uh, uh, karate at, at the time, Higuana would only teach one kata, basically sanshin to everyone. Everybody had to learn sanshin and one additional kata only. So, um, so th basically, if you went to his school, you only learned sanshin and additional kata probably. And they would do sanshin over and over and over and over again, every time for more than a year. And, um, but um, Higuana saw this, you know, the, uh, that Shoshin Miyagi was such a special uh, kid that he uh, started teaching him all the other katas because he knew that Shoshin Miyagi would succeed him in the school. So, next slide. And um, over the years, as Kanri Higuana got older, and he knew that he, you know, he was, uh, he didn't have that many more years to live, he said, he told uh, Miyagi he should go to China and, and go to the roots of where he learned his katas from and, and do some research there. So in 1915, um, Miyagi went to China and uh, he didn't find uh, Ryu Ryu Ko. He had, he had passed away at that point, but he found one of Ryu Ryu Ko's students. And, and so he uh, spent some time with him and it's probably then that's when he brought the bubishi back with him to uh, to Nahate. And um, when Miyagi came back uh, and took over the school after Kanri Higuana's death, um, uh, Miyagi started uh, developing the three other katas that we know in our style, which is Gegi Saich, Gegi Saini, and Kata Tensho, because he felt that these were more suited to, um, to uh, beginners and uh, older students. Um, and again, here, this is again, they, all they had to do prior to developing Gigi Saij, um, all beginners had to do endless training of Sanshin over and over and over again. And, and here's a picture of Miyagi teaching actually Kata Saifa to his students. It's one, it's a very, one of the older pictures we, I could find. And look at these, look at these squats. It's funny that before we, uh, were involuntarily removed from the dojo, that this was something we really started stressing. These deep squats, you know, where we've been talking about how the legs should be nearly parallel to the ground, just beautiful. And so, you know, this is, this is, how, it's, this is how it's intended to be done, not kind of an angle of your legs. It's, it's deep just, just below or just above, um, just above parallel. And what's interesting, if you analyze this picture a little bit, these three guys, these three seasoned guys in the front, um, obviously get it. And then look at this guy right here. You know, obviously he's got his pants on. He doesn't have a gi yet. Not quite the squat that it needs that it needs to be, right? So it's again, it just fascinates me on how things don't necessarily change. Where we can use some work is that every we need all our senior belts to get like this. So that if we do have one of these classes that we look like this, where the senior belts have this deep, beautiful squat, <clears throat> and then the junior belts are looking at that, and eventually we'll get there when they get in front. But the last comment is, again, just to appreciate the history and the legacy, this could be any one of you. This could be, um, you know, Dominic, you know, with his super deep squat, <clears throat> and put him there in a colored picture. And it would look in, in one of the one of the instructors in the back, and it would look just like this. So, it really is again very fascinating on how this has been carried on by purely by word of mouth for almost a hundred years. So um, up until then, um, the 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 art that uh, Shoujo Miyagi was practicing was called Nahate still, uh, didn't really have a name. So in the 1930s, uh, one of his students um, was sent to Japan to one of the martial arts uh, demonstrations over there. And while he was there, he was asked what the name of his style was. And the student, his name was Shinzato, he, he didn't know how to answer that. So when he came back to Okinawa, he went up to his master uh, Shoujo Miyagi and told him, uh, <laughs> You know, they asked me this question and I didn't know how to answer it. What should I have said? And so Miyagi said, you're absolutely right. We, we don't have a name for our style. So he spent the next few days thinking about it. And he turned to his, his version of the Bobishi, which was again that 
that book that was handed down, you know, through the last generations. And in that book, he read a line that said, Hogo Ju Donto, which means the way of inhaling and exhaling is hardness and softness. And in fact, you know, they were, um, you know, you have the hard and soft in Gojuru, as well as this, this emphasis on breathing, which we do in Kata, uh, in Sanshin. And so he said, you know, I think I found the name of our style and it's going to be Gojuru. And that's how uh, the name Gojuru was officially named and registered um, around, the thir- around the 30s. And that's sort of the story of Gojuru. So, in terms um, of so, so that's that's the end of Goju. Any questions? Any questions on that? Makes sense. Okay, so we've we've let we've let um, led into where we were. Where again, Tite Tode, that then resulted in the regional styles of Shurite, Nahate, and Damarite. Then those then developed not till the 1930s that now Nahate was given a name. And um, and so that name was Gojuru, and so that's where we are today. Um, Senpai, Tom, you have a question? Uh, Shihan, how does Goshen Kai relate to that? The word Goshen. Um, Goshen, Goshen Kai just means it's more of a generic term for just like karate school. I think it's I think it's training a training house or something like that. So <clears throat> Goshen. Goshen Kai is a generic, it's more of a generic term. It's not a style per se. Good question. Thank you. So, so now we're going to get into some of the key players outside, outside of all of this. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, when uh, Shihan, you've been and, and spent some time in Okinawa and I'm curious, does the, does the local population have a presence of mind about this rich history that they have? Do they treasure it? Do they recognize it? Or <laughs> how, and how much of the population is uh, sort of knowledgeable of uh, one of the martial arts that come from there? Can you comment on that? I, I can. Um, and the answer is, it's, it's, much, it's much like here, uh, where it's, it's known and it's appreciated um, to a little deeper level, but not not like not like you'd think. To give, to give you, uh, so they're they're more they're more into um, more of the um, the just the traditional history. They they so so there were a lot of parades. There were lots of parades. They had a lot of. Um, um, uh, regular events where you know they bring basically like a fair they bring and there might have been one karate demonstration but there were a lot of drum the drums is a big thing they dress up and they've got these big drums that they beat and they really appreciate their music uh that kind of thing so so there is a there is an awareness of it but it's really more Truly, the the karate people are the ones that really appreciate it. To give you give you another example, um, is I, I as part of the research for this, I, I opened up a, a another book that I have to. Um, the, it's I open it up again. I've looked at it dozens of times, and it's the history of Okinawa, and it's a 400 page book on just the history of Okinawa, and it's. Is, it's interesting you ask this question because there's only one tiny mention of karate in that whole 400 pages, and they even refer to it as karate, and in parentheses they put Japanese boxing. So it, it's it's there, but it is a little bit like like it is here, where there's there's those that practice it and those that don't. So. Um, you know, there's there's some of the some of the there's a couple landmarks in Naha and in in Shuri where there's there's acknowledgement of it, but um, it, it's not unfortunately it's not as as rich as 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 you might think. It's a it's a good it's a good question, but it's you know it's even and and even uh, that's it's, you know some of the dojos that are there they're. They're very, they're very uh, sublime and you know, relatively small, 
Um, and it's 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 funny just to just as a quick uh, side point relative to even some of the some of the names that we're going to be going through is that you know the seven they mentioned the 60s and the 70s and to a lesser degree the 80s there were a lot of names there a lot of you know in those, when I was growing up it was Bruce Lee and uh, um, Chuck Norris not only the movie stars but uh, Bill Wallace and uh, uh, Mike Stone. They were just you could all you could spew off names of karate people, <laughs> and that's gone now. And to some degree, yes, there's some of that related to MMA, but uh, but it's not it's not the same. So there, we're really kind of reaching a point now where even some of the names are starting to fade away. Uh, I just did a just did a book review of of uh, a really nice. I'll, I'm going to give you guys the links you look at, and I recommend you get the book on. It's just an encyclopedia of martial arts, and the the I spoke to the author, and uh, he's 75 years old, and you know he's authored 50, 60 books, something like that, and he's a big guy in the 70s doing choreograph, but but you know he's going to fade away, and you know all these all these guys are dying now, so we're kind of entering an era now where it's less about the people than it is about the style. So, sorry, it's kind of a long winded answer to, to back to your question is it's, it's there. Um, but really what Okinawa is about is if you are into karate, then you just, it's just a beautiful thing. I just, I remember there, one of the places we would practice on outside this gym on top of a hill, this grassy hill overlooking the China Sea. We practice at dusk, and so you'd see the sunset. And then I'm there with my bow, and I'm doing bow kata, and I just I turn to somebody. So I'm pinching my. I got to pinch myself because here I am, uh, in the late 20th century, uh, doing the exact same thing that they were doing, you know, 70, 80 years ago. So, anyway, sorry, it's a kind of long and answer question, but the short answer is. It's there, but it's not quite as as deep as as you might think. I mean, pick last thing, pick pick a sport, you know, pick baseball, right? It's you know, somebody from outside the U.S. might say, "Man, is everybody into baseball? You guys started that thing. It's America's pastime, all that." And you know, the reality, yes, there are a lot of baseball fans, but of the 300 million people in the United States. You know, only a small fraction of them care about baseball. Any other questions? Okay, so now, so, so that's now we're through go through, and we're just going to point out a couple others. And the point with these is these are these are uh, pioneers that you that you should be aware of and know about and regurgitate them. And, you know, we will we will we will be in front of people again and you will be in front of students again so these we, these we want you to know uh, so first one is anko itosu who was a contemporary of uh, kanryu higawana lived around the same time um, itosu was uh, lived in shuri uh, and he was a secretary to the king well, when the king was still there and uh, he practiced of course uh, the art of shurite at the time and and then when um, when uh, when they abolished the king uh, the uh, the kingdom and uh, removed the king and sent him back uh, sent him to Tokyo, he he stayed in Shuri and and started teaching um, uh, his style of karate, uh, which was uh, Shuri Te or they called it Shuri New his particular style. Um, he was instrumental around 1900 in getting uh, karate to the Okinawan schools. And what's important to know is also, at least that you heard of it, is he wrote the 10 precepts of karate. The 10 precepts of karate uh, basically are what is karate, how to understand karate, um, how to live the karate way, and how to practice karate. And uh, I'm not going to go into these in, in detail, but he's the one who authored these. And um, he's also the creator of uh, the Pinan, one through five, the ones we do and uh, Nahanji, uh, one through three. And he had a student, um, and his student, uh, his name is uh, Geshin Funakoshi, 
And he is also very, very famous because Gishin Funakoshi is uh, sort of considered widely known as the father of modern karate. He is the uh, creator of uh, Shotokan, if you wish. And uh, he's basically given credit to bringing uh, karate over to Japan, uh, to introduce karate to mainland Japan. Um, in fact, uh, he then moved to Japan and started teaching at various universities karate um, in Japan. And he authored a few books uh, that I've uh, shown here, uh, My Way of Life, The Essence of Karate, and Karate do Kyohan. I'm going the wrong direction. Just a quick comment on the pinons. So the pinon forms were, uh, were developed because at the time, in, you, you saw the, the, the kata that came over from uh, China that Higaona brought over and, uh, and everybody, so those were fairly sophisticated kata and most all of the original pioneers of, of Tode and then eventually the, uh, the regional styles, they were like, we love this, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's start straight with calculus, forget arithmetic, let's just get into this, or forget, uh, yeah, basic arithmetic, let's jump straight into calculus. And so that would be akin to, okay, now let's teach other, let's teach everybody math. All right, let's start, what is a derivative? And everybody's like, I don't mean, what's, I don't, what is that? I don't, what's two plus two? I don't even know what that is. So, so he created the penon forms as a, um, uh, as to, as simplified kata, so that begin so they could start introducing it and making it a little bit more accessible to beginners, to older to older people, to really simplify it. And so the pinons came from him for that reason. And then Funakoshi developed the taikyoku kata. So the pinons are universal to most every um, every style. Some call it heian, h e i a n. If you see Heian, it's synonymous with Pinan. Uh, I think I think actually Funakoshi called it Heian for uh, I think it was a different dialect. I think Pinan is more Okinawan and Heian is um, is more uh, pure Japanese. And so um, so the kata the video that you're getting uh, that's coming out is the kake. So the first one is Taikyoku kake. And we don't say kata jodan, but if you look in the booklets that you guys have, it is kata taikyu, taikyoku jodan. So anytime you see taikyoku, it represents and means a basic kata, really just more for, for practicing the technique. There's some bunkai in it, but that really wasn't the purpose. The, the more sophisticated kata are all about the hidden techniques and the throws and the joint locks and the breaks and all of that. The Taikyoku kata and the Pinan kata are really more, for, it's just basic exercises. You remember your math, you remember your multiplication tables. You know, that's what the Pinans are. They're the, and that's what the Taikyoku kata are. And, yep. And so here are the lineages again for Gojuru and Shotokan. Um, and in terms of Gojuru, we went through that. Um, Kadri Higuana going over to, uh, to China under Ryu Ryu Kuroshi, um, studying Fujin White Crane, bringing over the katas, and then um, Shojun Miyagi is the main student of uh, Kadri Higuana studying Gojuru. And then on the other side, uh, uh, from Shurite, um, Uncle Itosu's teacher was Soten Matsumara, and um, he is the creator of, uh, the, he did Shurite, and uh, his student, Gishin Funakoshi, started Shotokan. And so you have these two, these are the two main lineages and of karate that we have right now. The other ones, there are some that are derivatives of these, uh, students of Shotokan. And uh, um, so this is as far back as you can go in terms of karate, the ones that we have now. Yeah, so it starts with a few and then it just, then it really, the, the, the tree starts branching out. Um, the, the, um, uh, the final point here is um, that we, um, what was my final, my final point, um, was that the, the really, so uh, Itosu, he, start, he did start putting um, karate into some of the schools, he introduced to police forces, he's tried to introduce it to the military, 
that's kind of where the peons came from. It's like these guys, there's like, hey, look, you got six weeks to train these these soldiers in karate. They don't have four years to develop, you know, develop their skills. So you're going to have to jump. You're going to have to move a little bit quicker. And that's where he came up with the peons. Um, and then and then Funakoshi, then he re then and he really broadened it. He went up the mainland and really got it into the physical education systems. With my main, the point I want to make is that karate was all about getting it out there. It was all about propagating it. It's a good thing. We want everybody to use it. Good physical fitness, good spiritual, good mental, hand-eye coordination, self-defense. So everybody should 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 be aware of it and should practice it. Compare that to the Chinese. And Kung Fu was the opposite. So Kung Fu was very secretive. And so it was, even when it got to the United States, it was still, it took a long time for Kung Fu to get out to where it is. And that's, it's not a coincidence <clears throat> that you see a heck of a lot more karate schools than you do see Kung Fu schools. And, you know, Taekwondo and some of the other styles is for a different day. But, uh, but that's really the nature of that. And so that leads us to where we are now. So now we're in Japan. We've again moved from, we started in Okinawa. There was this movement to and from China that influenced some of it. Funakoshi then took it up to mainland Japan. How did it get to America? How did it get to America? So um, there was a gentleman by the name of Robert Trias. He was in the US Navy at the time. <laughs> and he was their middleweight boxing champion. And that was during World War II. And he was stationed on the Salomon Islands in World War II. And <laughs> while he was there, he met a master by the name of Tungi Singh, um, who became his first karate instructor. And, and they did, basically they did a trade. So Tungi Singh said, you teach me boxing and I'll teach you karate. And so this exchange happened while he was there. And then he was promoted to Black Belt in 1942 in the Shuri Ryu system. And, um, and so when he came back to America, to the United States, he opened up his first karate school in Phoenix, Arizona in 1946. And um, that was the first <coughs> open karate school in the United States. Up until then, um, there were some, I think, I mean, um, Shion, correct me if I'm wrong, there were some Kung Fu schools that were held in secret and private. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, Kyoshi was telling me these stories uh, where everything was still held in private, but um, he was uh, the first, Robert Trias was the first to have like an open school where everybody could come. And he created the U.S. Akari Association in 1948. And so this is, this is where we're going to conclude. So this is it. So now you've seen this whole history up to a point where now karate is landed in the United in the United States. Now, to be technical on this, there were um, there were goju goju and 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 kempo were in Hawaii by 1946. They they actually were there in the late 1930s. But technically, you, Hawaii was a U.S. territory at the time, so you you could argue that maybe it's it got to Hawaii and technically that was part of the United States, but really truly getting into the continental United States and officially um, into America, if you will, it was Robert Trias. And so this is really where the where one, one phase of the history of karate ends and, an, and another one starts. So we've got a couple, couple more, we're gonna go into the lineage. So any, any other questions or comments or thoughts? I, I just had one more thing I forgot to mention. And that was uh, so Miyagi, when he came back from China, he, he had done a lot of research there and he'd written a lot down, including he had the Bubishi as well, um, which in fact others had too, so uh, copies of. But during, uh, during the Battle of Okinawa in World War II um, and, and the fighting that happened and the bombing, his house was burnt down and all his records were lost. So there's, that's how we don't have hardly any records in terms of written down records for Gojuru. All right, great. All right, so then um, just the last comment on a, it's not so much a pioneer, but I just I wanted to share these pictures with you. Uh, this is Master Sakichi Odo, so that's who I trained under in Okinawa. 
He was uh, really part of Okinawa Kempo Karate and Kobudo. Kobudo is weapons, and this this guy was um, I shouldn't say this guy. This master was uh, just incredible. What he knew, and you know, he knew all of the Kempo Kata, which were more of the tradition of the Shotokan uh, side. Uh, but then a half a dozen, a half a dozen bow kata, half a dozen side kata, nuncha kata, all of these. So just, um, just very pre precision. It was, uh, it was pr privileged to be able to train under him. He passed away in 2002, but, uh, but again, it was, it's the, the tradition, the tradition again continued. So he was tied to, uh, somebody named Nakamura and he, he, I believe Nakamura was, uh, came out of Higaona. So, Besides just wanting to share this with you in, in my past, um, also there's this whole concept of Kempo. So that leads us to our lineage. So a lineage implies a line, right? A, B, C, D, E, all right? Your parents had you, you had parents, you're gonna have some kids and they have kids and they have kids. So our lineage is not quite that simple. And part of it also includes, we didn't talk about Kempo at all. This is all about the history of karate per se. And as I said, those really handful of styles were the seeds. And then a lot of things started branching out after that. And Kempo was one of those. And Kempo is really just um, really, a it's essentially karate, um, but it was, it was, uh, originated more in Japan than it did in Okinawa. So that's, if, for lack of a better, that's probably the best uh, ex um, definition I've been able to come with, come up with, because again, it's it's a little bit complicated because of all these variations and uh, permutations of karate that that came out. So, um, so our lineage is a convergence. Okay, so really listen up. Really listen up to this. And again, you're going to get copies of this, but and this is the, you, this is probably the most important slide of them all because as Sensei Tom said, this is what this is what you need to know relative to where we came from. So it's it's really a, a convergence rather than a lineage. So there's two sides of this. Let's um, just focus on Hawaii right now. So so. From Japan uh, came a gentleman by the name of James Matosi, and he introduced Kempo into Hawaii in, uh, again, the 1940s, before, before, before 1946, I think, again, early 40s, during World War II. And so he was pure Kempo, and it was really just called Kempo. There wasn't any particular style associated with it, and uh, it was just... Kempo was a it was a type of self defense, a type of karate. Not as much as many kata in Kempo as opposed as a, as, a, as as opposed to sets and uh, and sequences, a la Kempo striking exercise. So Matosi that and he is Matosi is known hands down as the father of Kempo. He uh, or I'm sorry of American Kempo. So there's really very little uh, dispute on that. And then one of his key students was William K.S. Chow. And uh, I forgot what K.S. means, but it's, it's Kai, Kai Soon or something like that. And uh, William Chow is also hands down known as the number two Kempo guy. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, just more of a... Kempo guy is kind of a generic term for that's what he did. That's what he knew. So a, a key student of uh, directly with Matosi, but more directly with William Chow in Hawaii was Masaicho Oshiro. So Oshiro learned Kempo from Matosi and Chow in Hawaii, in Hawaii and then Oshiro also went back and forth to Okinawa to pick up Gojuru from Gogen Yamaguchi, who we didn't mention, um, and, and maybe we'll, I think we, he's in there, so we'll probably maybe add it to the last one. So, but Gogen, Gogen Yamaguchi is really the last 
recognized descendant of Miyagi, karate descendant, not a not a relative. And then after Yamaguchi, it just went everywhere. There's a lot of different pe- people who lay claim to having the direct tie to Miyagi and being the having in, and were tasked with continuing the legacy of of Gochiru. But Yamaguchi is for the most part known as the the, the legitimate tied to Miyagi. And then again, then after that, there's some legitimate, uh, less legitimate, some illegitimate ties. So so now you have Masicho Ishiro, Kempo expert, Goju expert. So he started a school called, uh, a, a, a school called uh, Tekken Jitsu Kai. And Kai, again, is like karate house. Uh, Goshen, you got Goshen Kai and Jitsu, Jutsu Kai. Tekanashi Jitsu, ring a bell, that came out of that came out of this Hawaiian school right here. So, so um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting certain key points here. Um, but in his school, he taught which in his school he taught Tekken Tekken Jitsu, and which I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Tekken Jitsu Kai was the name of the school where he taught Kempo from Hawaii. He learned from Matosi and Chow. And Goju Ru, they learn from Yamaguchi. Okay, so that's that's the convergence. Again, it's not so much of a lineage where he Miyagi taught it to Yamaguchi, who taught it to Ashiro, who taught it to Kyoshi, teaches it to us. There's some of that, but there's this whole Kempo tie, and Kempo is very important to Kyoshi. It's very important to his school. It's also very unique because then two of Oshiro's key students were somebody in the name of Roy Cadiente and Rodney Hu and uh, Sensei Tom and uh, Sensei George. Did you go to Sensei Hu's training up in Stockton? Were you around then? So not finding so, my mute button. No, I, sorry. Okay, okay. So you know, Sensei Ed was there. Sensei Ed uh, Deverdesian was there too. So. Uh, so they met in Stockton. They were both in, again, Hawaii. They both moved to Stockton together. And then Kyoshi moved to Orange County. And uh, Sensei Rodney, he stayed in Stockton. So he branched off. Sensei Rodney branched off. And he start, He just really stuck with Goju Ru. He just, he, not that he forgot or dis, dis, discounted tempo. He just committed himself to Goju Ru. Whereas Kyoshi branched off. And he kept the Kempo as part of Gojuru. And that's why you see in this logo here, it says Kempo Karate. Notice it doesn't say Gojuru in there anywhere. The Gojuru is kind of embedded in this karate word right here, whereas Kempo comes from this side of our convergence. So that's where we come from. And so now we have this nice, clean OCIGK which is predominantly we teach on the platform of Goju-Ru, but we integrate Kempo in there as well. And it's, it's, you, you hear a lot about Goju, you don't hear much about Kempo, but you're doing it, whether you, whether you know it or not. So is that more confusing or does that clarify it? Wheelan? What do you, what what questions do you have about all that? It's it's just um it's just all so so with all the the flow chart. Okay, so let me and so that's a good point. Let me let me now just simplify it. So we have Kempo from Hawaii, Goju from Okinawa, that was learned by Masicho Oshiro in Hawaii, passed down to Kyoshi and then pass down to us. So if you want to simplify that, then that's, that's, that's one way to do it. So again, the key is, and, and go ahead and everybody digest this. And then when we get together, if you want to email me or give me a call to, to, to go through it to, to um, clarify any confusion. But the, the main point here is that there's two, two paths to where we are today. So we have Kempo and Gojuru all came out of Hawaii. All right. And with that, any final questions before 
Sensei Tom wraps up. Okay, great. All right, Sensei Tom. All right, so yeah, we made it to the end. Uh, thank you for your, your attention. And we went a little bit over, but uh, I think this was great. Again, uh, Sensei uh, JC, thank you for putting this together. Um, so now you know the names of the creators of karate, right? And why and how it was developed over time. Um, you know, if you haven't done so already, um, you know, check out those books that's in the presentation. It's also on our website as well. Um, it's a it's a fun read. You know, if, if I know many of you are reading for education, uh, but if you can block a you know 45 minutes or so, um, you'll crush these books. It's very easy, quick read much smaller than I think the textbooks that you guys are using now. So, you know, read it, it's very interesting. Um, and you know, as black belts, right, now you know the lineage um, of our school and of Kiyoshi. And you know, it's true that when people hear Goji Ru, they'll, they'll ask you the lineage, it's really the, the left side that they care about. You know, they, they all know, you know, who, uh, you know, the, the main founders of Goji Ru, and they all want to understand how you know, our uh, Kiyoshi you know, what the lineage is to that point. So that's kind of the, the key area. But uh, if others are interested in the white campos in our name, then you can also answer that as well. So um, you also learn, you know, that uh, Goji Ru, the, you know, we have the hard style that kind of came from the, the Shodokan style incorporated into the soft style of the martial arts. And, you know, and finally, you know, as black belts in Goji Ru, right now we've learned the history. Now you are part of history. And you are helping to carry on the tradition of Goju Ru. So you know, one day, hopefully, you'll be here, um, you know, presenting this to to your students. So thank you so much. Awesome. So can, I, can I make a? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to make a comment. I thought uh, you were coming to an end there. I just wanted to say <coughs> uh, kudos to all of you for putting together this uh, excellent um, uh, uh, excellent scholarship, putting all of this stuff together. Um, you know, I felt like I was listening to a BBC documentary. Documentary. <laughs> uh, great job, all of you. Uh, thank you. Also, just another story on the lineage. Uh, some years ago, um, I had to work in Colorado for uh, basically every other week, and so I was missing a lot of the classes at our dojo. And so <clears throat> um, I talked to Kyoshi about it. I said, uh, how would you feel about me going to another uh, dojo just to train and, and so forth? He said, sure, go ahead. So I, I ended up going to two different dojos, and I ended up sticking with one. But the story that I wanted to tell you about lineage is on, on uh, the very first day, uh, I think I was a brown belt at the time, on the very first day that I went, my, uh, you know, the instructor there, the head instructor asked me, who is your teacher? And who is your teacher's teacher? <laughs> so they were very interested and focused on lineage, to my surprise. I wasn't expecting that. And I, of course, I knew who Kyoshi was, but I drew a blank on my who was my teacher's teacher. So anyway, and, and I think that's a great way to put it. Is the Quillen? I didn't mean to. to uh, oh yeah, you just happened to. I just happened to see your your little image on the screen there. So, but this is that's the that's really a good way to put it. Know who your teacher is, who your teacher's teacher is, and now you can go one. So my CHO is zero. And now you can go, if you want, you can go your teachers, 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 and then it doesn't, you don't really need to go beyond that. But I think that's, it's really, if you get anything out of it, it's who's your teacher, Kyoshi, Roy Cadiente, and who was his teacher, Masichi Oshiro. So, all right, so just if, give me t just two more minutes to make just a couple more general, uh, just some, some updates uh, for you. So. Everybody's going to get a copy of this presentation, just like the other one. You know, feel free, print it out, uh, put it together in a little notebook, and all this stuff is 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 good info to have, and you know, start creating your own your own body of knowledge. Um, so you know, use it, and anything here again, we ask you not to distribute it, but have with you and refer back to it regularly. And please, if you start forgetting it, refresh it, because again, the point here is we want our black belts to be more tune and aware of this than the others. If you lay out all the black belts in the United States, um, I think it would be a very, very small percentage of anybody who can know what who Anko Tosu was and what his role was in karate. Okay, so I think that's you know just we want we want we want to be that percentage of black belts that, that have that. Okay, so so that's that. Um, 
check with your parents, but it, if you can, I just watched Hitman Four, which is it's a kung fu movie. It's a, it's kung fu, but there's always karate in it. And kung fu always beats karate, but that, it's a little bit violent. So check with your parents, but it's it's not inappropriately violent. It, the Ip Man movies are it's I P space M A N four. Um, the, those are phenom. It's a phenomenal series. So if you've got some time and need something to watch and don't have anything better to do, of course we want you to read first. But if you want to see a good movie, I just watched it. It's called Ip Man Four. Uh, the Kake video is coming out, and uh, and uh, it's uh, so make sure you watch that, learn that. Uh, if you want to volunteer for a video, go ahead and uh, let me know. Since Senpai Jorgensen just did that, and then lastly is that the updates where Irvine is starting to uh, give us some hint that there may be some as things open up around us that we may start opening classes again. And Kyoshi and I are working on how that's going to be defined. And so uh, next week there's going to be a conference call with the leadership team on um, what uh, what we're going to be doing. So uh, Sensei George, Sensei Ed, Sensei JC, keep, Sensei Tom, keep your Sensei Karina, keep your ears to the ground. Sensei Ashley on that. And that's it. Have a great night. Stay healthy. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a thank bye. You. Have a nice bye. night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you. Bye bye.